the transferritin, the iron that's floating around, is going to go low because your body's going to say, we don't want iron floating around because it's going to feed infection and we need to hang on to that iron and your hemoglobin is going to go low. So if you write these things down and then when you get your lab report back and you look at it, you'll know, okay, I need to eat more antioxidants because I think I'm inflamed. Dietary antioxidants. So we've already talked about the typical diet for dialysis and the typical instruction for dialysis. It is missing nutrients. We need to be eating things of color, eat lots of color, eat peppers, eat blueberries, eat strawberries, eat tons of greens, all of these. If it has color, you're going to know that it has antioxidants in there. That's what you need to be eating. Pre-dialysis, the same. If you want to stop those, um, stop that inflammation process, cool down that inflammation, eat dietary antioxidants, eat things with color. Um, eat fiber. We're going to talk about how your gut um, can produce antioxidants um, and then also help your body to make endogenous antioxidants. So one of those ways is through the gut. Um, but right now we're going to talk about how do you know? Okay. So we said if it has a lot of color, but how else do you know if a food has a lot of antioxidants? We can look at something called the ORAC scale. So, and you can Google this. Help me find foods high on the ORAC scale. What does that mean? The ORAC, oxygen radical absorbency capacity. You don't have to know that. How much, how, what is the antioxidant capacity of this food? You want it to be a high number. So if you look at the acai berry, it's very high. Blueberries, very high. I want you to go to the middle of the screen and look at oregano. Look at how high that is. With spices, they are super high in antioxidants. And here's the thing that you can do. You can kill two birds with one stone with this. You know, if you're a kidney patient, and you have high blood pressure, you need to back up on salt, right? Lower sodium. One way you can do that is by boosting up these dried spices that don't have any sodium. So not only are you lowering your sodium intake, but you're actually boosting your antioxidant intake, which is pretty amazing. But what happens is they just take, this is done in a test tube. So they'll take some, they'll take an oxidant and they'll take another um, element that is very prone to oxidation. And then they put one of these foods in there and see how well does the acai berry protect this element prone to oxidation from the oxidant? And that's how they come up with these numbers. Your body also makes antioxidants. These antioxidants are actually more powerful. The first antioxidants that I told you about that you eat from your diet, they'll handle that oxidant, that little angry oxidant in the middle on a one-to-one -one basis. These endogenous ones, they get a bunch of them all at one time. So what are your endogenous antioxidants? Glutathione peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, and catalase. You don't have to remember those names. All you have to know is there are certain foods that you need to eat to boost up these endogenous. Endogenous means made in the body antioxidants. And here's what you need to eat. So if you'll see, it's very similar to things that you just saw on the ORAC scale, like cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, bok choy, different fruits, teas like green tea, um, basil, there's your, there's your um, spices, parsley, sage, all those are spices, blueberries, cranberries. Um, so these are foods that you need to make antioxidants. Okay, next topic, the gut kidney access. All right, so let's review. We've talked about protein. We've talked about acid-based balance. We've talked about inflammation. And now we're talking about the gut kidney axis. So in your gut, there is a, a wall there and you'll see in it, this barrier, this intestinal barrier, the picture on the left is what you want it to look like. We believe that, especially in an end stage renal disease patient and a dialysis patient, that the picture on the right is what it looks like. And the reason that we think this is because many times dialysis patients are fluid overload and their belly can be distended the same as a congestive heart failure patient. And we know that congestive heart failure patients, theirs looks like this. So um, we don't want those junctions to be separated because you see the bacteria is leaving the gut and going to the rest of the body. So how, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to keep this from happening? Well, one keep your volume, stay to your fluid restriction if you're a dialysis patient, but also um, pre-dialysis or dialysis, uremic toxins can affect this lining. Also pre-dialysis or dialysis. In the inside where you see the little finger-like things on the inside of that lining, there is a mucosal layer, like a mucus. These bacteria that are escaping 
they love fiber. But if you don't feed them fiber, if you don't eat fiber and it goes to your gut, they will eat mucus. So they will eat away that mucosal lining. And then again, they'll go through. Okay. Dialysis patients need fiber. Pre-dialysis patients need fiber. Everyone needs fiber. I think it's one of the most underrated nutrients in the American diet. Um, the historical diet for dialysis patients was very low fiber. Um, but when you don't eat fiber, either pre-dialysis or dialysis, you have a you have an inflammatory environment now. You have um, short a lack of short chain fatty acids and increased secondary bile acids. Let me tell you what those are. So the um, the the short chain fatty acids are antioxidants. They will lower inflammation. Secondary bile acids are going to increase inflammation and actually make you at more risk for cardiovascular disease. So there are different things that can cause problems in the gut microbiota. So you want gut bacteria that do produce short chain fatty acids and don't produce secondary bile acids. But there's reasons why sometimes this gets a little out of whack. One of them is certain medications you may be taking, um, a low fiber diet, which we've already talked about, and high animal protein. Why is this? Okay, everything you eat is you eat it and it goes down and it, and it feeds certain bacteria in the gut. And then those bacteria produce a, something. They produce a product. We're going to call it a metabolite. Okay, that's all that big word means. It's just what are the bacteria in my gut producing? If you eat animal protein, the bacteria in your gut are producing kidney toxins. There's three, trimethylamine N oxide, we're just going to call it TMAO, P-crystal sulfate, and endoxyl sulfate. These are kidney toxins. So what? let's talk a little bit about TMAO. TMAO, made in the gut, cleared by the kidneys. If you are a pre-dialysis patient, TMAO is going to increase your progression towards kidney disease. This is produced as a result of when you eat animal protein, the choline and carnitine in animal protein, when it hits the gut, the, the bacteria will produce something called, it produces something called TMAO, and the, I mean TMA, and the bacteria will produce TMAO. If you're a dialysis patient, it's still a problem because even though your kidneys have failed, it's going to increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. And remember we said that greater than 50% of people that have kidney disease, they actually die of cardiovascular disease, not the kidney disease. P-crystal sulfate and endoxyl sulfate are very similar. Same thing. Whatever you eat, your gut is going to produce certain metabolites. If you are eating a lot of animal protein, your gut will produce two things called P-crystal sulfate and endoxyl sulfate. Both of these are kidney toxins. Um, both of these increase the risk of overall mortality and cardiovascular disease, similar to TMAO. Plant-based diets will decrease these levels by as much as 60%. It's interesting with TMAO, they've taken people who eat completely plant-based diets, total vegans, and if you fed that person a steak, they still won't produce TMAO unless they kept eating steaks for time on end. But because they don't, they don't even have the gut bacteria in there to produce TMAO. So this is yet another reason to eat a plant-based diet, whether you're pre-ESRD or dialysis. Bone mineral metabolism. Next topic. So we're going to talk about phosphorus first. What is phosphorus? Okay, phosphorus is just a mineral in your body. You actually need phosphorus. It's actually a good thing. People on dialysis probably think it's totally bad because their dietitian probably comes to them all the time and says, your phosphorus is too high. Your phosphorus is too high. Um, most of the time, pre-dialysis patients, you're not going to see that phosphorus level grow, go up. There's a reason for that. Um, but phosphorus uh, is key for bones, teeth, and cell membranes. And it, But your body wants to keep this phosphorus, your phosphorus and your calcium in balance. So why do you care? Pre-dialysis, if you have higher phosphorus levels, really it's going to be FGF23 is what you're going to see. Um, but regardless, you still need to watch, especially junk food phosphorus, pre-dialysis, you're going to have a faster progression. Dialysis, I'm sure you probably already know that it is going to increase your risk for uh, bone mineral metabolism disorders. You can begin to lay phosphorus and calcium down all over your body to where you'll calcify your body. It's just really a dangerous thing in dialysis. So plant-based phosphorus is bound to something called phytate. And phytate is only like 10 to 20% absorbed. So if you're a pre-dialysis patient, 
if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you're not going to hear me talk to you a lot about phosphorus because you're already doing it. If you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you solved the problem because it's only 10 to 20% absorbed if you're not eating a bunch of packaged processed foods. Animal-based diets are naturally rich in phosphorus just in their natural state. And that phosphorus is about 40 to 60% absorbed. But again, like I said, these animal protein is injected with phosphorus additives and that's about 90% absorbed. So if you're a pre-dialysis patient, this is going to increase your rate to progression. If you're a dialysis patient, this is where you're going to get your report card back every month and your phosphorus is going to be high and you're going to be getting into that deranged bone mineral metabolism. Your bones are going to become weaker and you're going to begin to lay phosphorus down all over your body. So serum phosphate levels were significantly lower in vegetarian um, patients than in non-vegetarian patients on hemodialysis. So the reason that I have this in red is because, again, in your dialysis center, you're going to hear things like, oh, you can't have that, those beans because they're high in phosphorus. Yeah, but they're, they're in the plant-based form. They're bound to phytate. You're not going to absorb that phosphorus. So just arming you with some information. Remember the 2020 KDOKI guidelines, you don't have a specific phosphorus restriction. It is specific to you. It is not 800 to 1000 milligrams. It is what is your phosphorus level? Do you know some people absorb phosphorus more than others? Some people, the dialysis machine works better to remove phosphorus than others. So it's, it's individualized to you. So if you're eating phosphorus and your phosphorus is normal, then you're fine. If not, you may need to cut back. Um, so this is what I was talking about with the pre-ESRD group, um, really both, but especially the, in the pre-ESRD group, your phosphorus, you may never see like on a lab report, it being high. And the reason is because in the background, you have this thing going on called FGF23. The problem is our doctors never really draw this, but just know that it's there. So as chronic kidney disease progresses, so does this, because what it does is FGF23 causes you to urinate out more phosphorus. So it's like your body's way of trying to keep the phosphorus within, within normal range. The problem with it is there's a strong association between increased FGF23 and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. There it is, heart disease again. Mm -hmm.